Greetings, Higher Grace Church. Wow, what an opportunity and an honor to be able to speak to you again uh, today. And uh, we uh, love our friends there uh, so dearly, the Prof and Dr. Rachel. Uh, we appreciate uh, their hunger for God. And uh, so I'm very honored to be able to bring you uh, a message here this morning. And I feel that this is a, a relevant message for the hour. When I trying to decide, Lord, what do you want me to speak on? It was this message, and the message basically is God of the Valley. And uh, we'll, we'll get right into this, but I just want to say we greet you here from America. We have the COVID-19 still on the loose, and I have many friends now and family that have it. Thank God that it's a very mild uh, case and people are recovering. So all over the globe, people are suffering through what we might say is the valley. And Christians are having all kinds of things happen to them, uh, regardless where you are on the globe. So God is a God of the entire world because he created it and man was made in his image and he knows exactly where we are today. So let's just get into this message. Uh, God of the valley. And uh, that's how I entitled this message and it starts with King Ben-Hadad, the king of the Syrians. Uh, his name meant son of the shouter. He was the king of Syria, and Syria was always at war with Israel. You know, our enemy, you know, the Bible says, Paul writes, your enemy, your enemy. is not God's enemy. The devil is not God's enemy. He's our enemy. He says, your enemy, the devil. So uh, we have always having the enemy uh, trying to attack us. And once again, they're trying to invade Israel. And they organized a 32-nation force to come against Israel. I mean, you can just go right now. We have COVID. There are financial issues around the globe. There are still plagues and sicknesses that people are going through. Now, I'm talking about Christians this morning. They came down to where Ahab, the king of Israel, lived. And they surrounded them. And Ahab asked, what are the demands that you have since you surrounded us? He was willing to give them whatever they wanted. And they answered, we want your gold and your silver, your most beautiful wives and your smartest children. Now, maybe all of us have a child we'd give away. You know, maybe that's, but I'm just kidding. But that's what they wanted. They wanted their their most brilliant children, they wanted their gold and their beautiful wives, and so Ahab agreed. But then Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, wanted to go through every house and take whatever they desired, and that was too much, even for Ahab. And this starts in 1 Kings chapter 20, and I'll read some of this to you this Today, it says, then the king of Israel in first Kings chapter 20, beginning verse seven, the king of Israel summoned all the elders of the land and said, please observe and see how this man is seeking our destruction. For he sent messengers to me for my wives and my children and my silver and gold. And I did not refuse him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, do not listen or consent to this additional demand. Now, I'm reading now the Amplified Bible, so it's a lot of words, but it stretches this meaning so that we don't miss it. So he sent word, Ahab sent word back to Benadad. We cannot agree to these additional terms, these demands. And verse 10 goes on to say, and Benadad sent word back to him and said, may the gods do so to me and more also if there's enough dust left of the Samaria for handfuls for all the armed people who follow me. In other words, there'll be nothing left of you. You know, that's the threat the enemy always makes if you don't give in to him. I'm going to destroy you if you don't give in to me. Verse 11 goes on to say, The king of Israel answered, Tell him, a man who puts on his armor to go to battle should not boast like the man who takes it off after the battle has been won. In other words, Ahab is saying to Benadad, Hey, brother, don't get ahead of yourself. You know, we don't want you coming in here and taking our stuff, but we're not going to let you do it either. 
And when Ben-Hadad heard King Ahab's answer, he told his army to get in position. And then a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, and they said, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great army? Behold, I will hand them over to you, and you shall know without any doubt that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus says the Lord, By the young men, the attendants or bodyguards of the governors of the districts. And then Ahab said, Who shall begin the battle? And he answered, You. I tell you right now, if I was sitting there, I would ask all the congregants of Higher Grace Church to look at each other and say, He's talking about you. You have to be the one to initiate this thing, but you're not alone in the battle. So then Ahab assembled an army of about 7,000, and they went out at noon. And while Benadad, verse 16, was getting drunk in the temporary shelters, he and 32 kings who were helping him, the young men of the governors of the districts went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent men out, and they told him, saying, Men have come out of Samaria. And he said, Whether they have come out for peace or for war, take them alive. And so these young men of the governors of the districts went out of the city, and the army followed them. And each one killed his man, and the Arameans, or the Syrians, they fled, and Israel pursued them. And Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, escaped on a horse with horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and struck the riders of the horses and chariots and killed the Syrians in a great slaughter. Then the prophet approached the king of Israel and said to him, Go strengthen yourself and observe and see what you have to do. For at the first of next year, the king of Syria will come against you. Basically, again, in other words, your enemy never stops coming. Now, here's what he says. Go strengthen yourself. I tell you right now, after every battle, you, you've got to keep yourself around the anointing because we go into battles. And if you're not around the anointing, you're trying to do this yourself. You'll never make it because you become like in the wild, an animal that begins to limp where he's totally exhausted. You have to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit every single day to be filled, to be full of the Holy Spirit. That is your energy. That's where your strength comes from. So he, the Lord is saying to them, hey, he's coming back at you. How many know that the enemy comes back at you? You win one battle and uh, on, the, on the mountaintop and then the enemy comes again. Verse 23 says, now the servants of the king of Aram said to him, Israel's God is a God of the hills. Now this is the enemy talking. The Syrians, they say Israel's God is a God of the hills. That is why they were stronger than we. But let us fight them against them in the plain or in the valley. And surely we'll be stronger than they. In other words, they were thinking their God is limited. And at the time, if you study it out, you find that that region of the world, they believed in regional gods. And so they thought, well, Israel's God is a God of the hills. That's why we lost. But now let's go down and take them out in the valley. And so the Syrians reinforced their military and their army in a greater number. 32 nations coming together. They replaced and added to all that they had lost. And they prepared to attack again. Verse 26 picks it up there. It says, At the first of the year in the spring, Benadad assembled and counted to the Syrians and went up to Aphek, east of the Sea of Galilee, to fight against Israel. And the sons of Israel were counted and given provisions, and they went to meet them. And the Israelites camped before the enemy like two little flocks of goats with everything against them except God. And the Syrians filled the country. Israel was completely outnumbered to the ridiculous and surrounded. You ever felt like that before where the enemy has you outnumbered and surrounded. And here we go again, verse 28. A man of God approached. Aren't you glad for the man of God that would come and bring, you know, direction? And a man of God approached and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, because 
The Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. I will give this great army into your hand, and you shall know by experience that I am the Lord. I don't know about you, man, but that goes right through me. God is saying, hey, are you looking around and see this enemy? They have said that I'm only a God of the hill. But I'm going to show you that and show them that I'm God of the valley. You know, and I'm going to show you by experience. You're not just going to be a spectator. Ephesians 3.19, Paul writes this, And that you may come to know practically through a personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge. Look, knowledge is great, but it can't surpass, you know, the personal experience. That you, through personal experience, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God, so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life. Filled to the full. If you're not filled today, what are you? Half full? Maybe you're half empty, depending on your outlook on life. The pessimist would say, well, I'm just, half, I'm just half empty. And the positive person would say, well, I'm half full. But either way, you are half. And some people are just getting by on the fumes. I tell you, God doesn't want you to live in the half. He wants you to live full in the fullness of God, to be filled and overflowing. The reality is your ministry comes out of the overflow. That's where you minister, out of the overflow, the effortless part of it. If you're straining and struggling to do ministry, my God, you need to stop in your place and get filled. Call on God to fill you full. You don't even have a preacher lay hands on you. Just ask God to come and fill you. That's where the power is. And that's what God is saying in this Old Testament message, that you would be completely filled uh, and flooded with God himself, Paul writes to the Ephesians, filled with God himself. In verse 29, back in Kings, so they camped opposite each other for seven days. Then on the seventh day, the battle began and the sons of Israel killed 100,000s of the Syrian foot soldiers in a single day. But the rest ran to the city of Aphek and the city wall fell on 27,000 of the men who were left. And ben Adad escaped and came into the city, going into an inner chamber to hide. Archaeologists have found and discovered that the foundation wall at Aphek was not secure enough so that the running of the thousands of men alongside it, the vibration of that wall, caused it to fall over. I tell you what, God will take out your enemy any way he wants. So God revealed that he was not only a God of the mountains, he is God of the valley. So many come to the modern day church where people come in carefree to worship a carefree God or really no God at all. When hard times come in their life, they drift from the church where everything has just been okay. With modern day theology, you're okay, I'm okay. And then they find out things in their life are not okay. They never develop any root in these places. It's so superficial. There's no presence of God in the house. I tell you what, if the Holy Spirit is not present, you don't even have a church. Therefore, they never get to know the God of the valley. Maybe they've had a glimpse of the God of the mountain but they never got to know the God of the valley. In times of trouble, many people fall out with God because they did not know he is a God of the valley. David declared, the Lord is my shepherd in Psalms 23. We all know this. The Lord is my shepherd to feed, to guide, and to shield me. I shall not want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and quiet waters. He refreshes and restores my soul life. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the sunless valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. 
for you are with me. Your rod to protect and your staff to guide, they comfort and console me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell forever throughout all my days in the house and in the presence of the Lord. God doesn't leave us in the valley. He takes us through the valley. He is God of the valley. He was saying to Israel and to us today, I have to let your enemy know every once in a while that I'm not only God of the mountain, I'm God of the valley. He has to let the enemy know that. He has to slap the devil upside the head and say, you know what, man? Uh, I am the God of the thing. I created you and I am the ultimate boss and I'm still the boss. But what he's saying to you and I, I'm going to use you. I'm going to take you through the valley to show that I am God. I tell you what, it's a powerful thing to show your enemy. I must take you through the valley. I tell you what, I feel like that's what's happening around the globe for believers. We're going through this valley of you know, plague and people are stuck in their homes. It's time to cry out for God. It's time for you to find that place, whether it's, you know, stuck at your house, to stick your head, man, in the carpet, stick your head in the floor and just begin to cry out. Get in that prayer closet and begin to cry out to God for him to show you what's going on. My people must know that I am not only the God of the mountain, but he's God of the valley. In order for you to understand, there's going to have to be a battle. In Exodus, God wanted his people to know that he was God of the valley. And he wanted the Egyptians to know it as well. In Exodus 14, starting verse 18, it says, And the Egyptians shall know without any doubt and acknowledge that I am the Lord. When I am glorified and honored through Pharaoh, through his warriors and his charioteers, he had them camped between two mountains, backed up against the Red Sea with nowhere to go. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and they saw the Egyptians marching after them and they were very frightened. And so the Israelites cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Isn't that how we think? Isn't it, isn't it how we think that God hates us somehow? That he's allowed a plague to come on us. He's allowed this to take place. Like you were having trouble already before the COVID came along. I'm telling you right now. So what's God done? He's now, you know, wasn't happy with me over here. So now we have to deal with this plague. What is this that you have done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Did we not say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians as slaves than to die in the wilderness. Many of them even said, show us the way back to Egypt. You know why? Because we did not know when we did those things, the God of the valley. God was saying, I want to bless you. You are my children. But these Egyptians think they are God. They don't know me. And God opened up the sea and Israel walked across on dry ground. Then God closed up the sea on Pharaoh and his army. Pharaoh, the Egyptian God, and his army drowned. The Lord saved Israel that day, verse 30, from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore. And when Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, they feared the Lord with reverence and awe, filled respect. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The enemy knows that as long as you only know the God of the mountain, when you get in the valley, you belong to him. It's how the world thinks. God has no power. You become no different than them. Even though I walk through the sunless valley of the shadow of death, you're going through the valley. You're not staying in the valley. 
I said, you're not going to stay in the valley. You're going through a valley, but you're not going to stay in the valley because God is saying to you, look, my friend, you may have only known me at a certain place. You may have only known me when I rescue you out of your dark place. And now things are not happening like you want. Listen, God is preparing you, strengthening you to let you know you can have faith in him that he will carry you through the valley. But you're going to go through it. He's going to use you. You know, he's going to set you on the side. He's going to show you why to strengthen your faith in him that he can take you through the valley. And once you know he can take you through that valley, my friend, you become a force against the enemy that he cannot even deal with. You're not going to stay in the valley. It's just a shadow. I fear no evil for you are with me, David said. Fear not for he is with you even today. Corey Ten Boom said this, there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. You'll never know Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. The greater reality is eternity. So what happens if you get taken out today? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your heart is sold out to him. You're a born again believer. The greatest reality of your life is to be with the Lord. On this earth, God has given you and I his power. His power is in us. By means of the Holy Spirit, which resides in each one of us. He wants that power to flow out of us. He wants us to come out of us and touch a lost and dying world. When the world is freaking out, we as believers ought to be standing strong. God will bring us through. God will set us on the mountain. He'll take us from the valley and take us to the top. He's with you in great power. Wake up. Look around. See your enemy gathering. He is mocking God. But God is about to take the low ground. God is about to take you through the valley to show that devil that he is still God. The battle is the Lord's and the battle is already won. On the cross, the enemy was defeated. And now you and I shall rise up from our dead religious grave, take off the grave clothes and become the warriors that God has created us to be full of the fire of the Holy Ghost. Face that valley. Know that God is about to use you to show the enemy, to show that devil that is always harassing you. He's still the boss. He is God of your valley. I tell you what, man, somebody ought to shout. He is God of the valley. You know what? I hear people say we need another Pentecost. We don't need another Pentecost. We need to embrace the Pentecost that's already come 2,000 years ago. In Acts chapter 2, it fell on them like tongues of fire and they were filled. Many people get touched, but they don't get filled because they will not let go of the things in their life. Fire, as my friend Dave Jones said, always in the Bible was judgment. When God comes and judges you, finds you hungry for him, he fills you with his power. Fills you with his strength. Fills you with the gifts. And it's a process that takes place all the days of the rest of your life. My friends, that's my message to you today in South Africa. To higher grace. To that entire denomination that I believe God has formed. To see the greatest move of God that South Africa has ever seen. I tell you right now, God is just looking for one person that'll say, I'll surrender all. One person that'll be obedient to that which he's crying out for. And I pray today, even now, that that person or persons will rise up in this hour. For he is God of the valley. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this denomination and the leaders. I thank you for my friend, the prof and Rachel. We pray for them, O oh God. Strengthen them. Raise them up. The bold soldiers that they are. I pray, God, you will surround them with great army of people that will stand with them in this hour, Lord. I pray for all of those that are listening to me today, that though you think you're in some valley, that God has abandoned you. You need to know today that he is God of the valley. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. I pray, Father, for those that are away from you, those that at one time, knew you, but things have happened that have caused them to drift away. I pray now by the Holy Spirit, you'll prick their heart and they'll find themselves in that prayer closet. They'll find themselves crying out to you to touch them. And Lord, wherever they may be, 
Let the fire of heaven fall on them and shake South Africa, shake the, the continent of Africa by what you're doing in these meetings. In Jesus' name I pray. And all that are listening said, Amen. God bless you, my friends. Stay true to that which God has placed in your heart. Go through the valley hanging on to God and see the victory. For God shall surely bring the victory. Amen. The victory is yours. God bless. We'll see you next time.